we will we will now move uh, to the next uh, session, the first session of the day, which is uh, an introduction to cancer medical imaging repositories and a discussion about their importance in research and clinical practice. So a little bit of trying to put in practice the vision that Thanos just shared with us. Uh, we will be hearing uh, about research uh, infrastructures and existing data repositories built in the context of the AI for Health Imaging projects from our speakers. Uh, we will hear about the incisive project uh, by myself. We will hear about the Radioval project uh, by Dr. Oliver Diaz. We will hear about ProCancer Eye from Dr. Costas Marias. Uh, we will hear about PRIMAS and Chimillion projects from Dr. Ignacio Blanques, and uh, uh, we will hear about EUCIM uh, trying to unite all these data repositories and all these research infrastructures under one interoperable roof uh, from uh, Dr. Luis Marti Bonmati. Let's start uh, with Incisive. I am Jana Tsaku, a senior project manager at Grupo Maggioli that is also the coordinating entity of the incisive project, uh, which I am coordinating. Uh, I have included some key facts about our project, uh, which is funded ad under H 2020, under the call on AI for health imaging. Uh, some key facts about our consortium. Uh, we are 26 partners covering uh, several areas related to health data sharing, but also um, uh, AI development, uh, HPC, complex systems integration, clinical research, of course, and data provision, uh, patient representation and evaluation, legal and ethical issues, uh, and business innovation and planning. Incisive has two main objectives. One is the development of an AI-based toolbox that supports the decision-making of healthcare professionals uh, in cancer care. We are developing uh, services for patient prioritization, cancer diagnosis, lesion segmentation, uh, risk for metastasis, prog uh, prognosis, and more. And uh, we are addressing four types of cancer in our project. Uh, we are addressing uh, breast, uh, colorectal, prostate, and lung cancer. And this brings me to the second major uh, and important objective of our project. In order to build this tool set and to validate this tool set properly, we are building an interoperable federated health data repository, which is required to bring the mass of data that is needed in order to train and validate our AI tools. And we are doing this uh, in compliance with, uh, data, with legal, ethical, uh, and privacy requirements. In Incisive, we are using a hybrid uh, data st uh, storage approach. Uh, this means that we are accommodating both local nodes that are located at each data provider site, uh, as well as a central node that is available to those data providers who do not wish to set up their own local node. And uh, we are also developing federated learning mechanisms in order to be able to exploit the federated data. We are addressing uh, almost all modalities, imaging modalities uh, in our project. We are collecting data from nine data providers, aggregating in their turn data from 12 hospitals from five different countries. And in addition to the cancer imaging data, we are also collecting um, accompanying clinical data that link to the images, for example, on treatment, on gene mutations, uh, lab laboratory results, and more. In order to do this, we had to uh, address all, all parts of the process related to data collection and data management, starting from an, the ethical approval uh, for sharing the data up to image de-identification, uh, extraction of the clinical data linked to the images, uh, quality checking uh, and uh, data homogenization based on a common data model, and eventually sharing the data through the incisive federated uh, data repository. Throughout our uh, lifetime of the incisive project, which is coming to an end in March 2024, we've come to realize that there are a lot of benefits 
uh, in, in sharing data. These are only some, uh, some of these, uh, not even an exhaustive list. We, uh, we contribute to transparency, we contribute to, to reproducibility of AI results. We maximize, of course, the utility and impact of the data collected. We make sure that this data is preserved in the long term and stored securely. securely. And there are also several benefits for the data providers in, ten, in, ter in terms of having more citations, uh, in terms of uh, making collaboration easier, and many, many more. Of course, there are also challenges, as we initially mentioned in the introduction. There are technical challenges, we are all aware of these, related to data interoperability, related uh, to the infrastructure that will store the data, many challenges also legal, ethical, and political challenges. Uh, and uh, there are still motivational challenges to motivate the data providers to provide their data and continue to provide them even beyond the, the end uh, of the project's lifetime. And even when the motivation is there, we still have to overcome economic and sustainability challenges. I think these are challenges that all infrastructures trying to bring data together are, are facing. In order to address the technical challenges, some of the things we've done, we've agreed with all of our data providers on common data collection and data preparation protocols that address um, almost all aspects uh, of, of data collection. We have used widely accepted standards uh, and created uh, our common data model in order to make the data interoperable. We have been based on DICOM and NIFTY for the images and SNOMED CT, LOINC uh, and FIRE for the uh, clinical data and uh, eventually created uh, a search facility to uh, enhance the discoverability of our data for interested reusers of the data. Uh, I should also say that uh, our common data model has been documented and is available uh, in the link that you see uh, in, in the end of this slide. The slides will be shared. To address the legal, ethical and political challenges, we have been working on the incisive data sharing framework. And uh, this is based on a controlled, ac controlled access approach, which means that the metadata, the information about the data sets available by uh, our data providers are publicly uh, available in, in the public part of the incisive portal. Uh, however, the, um, the users, the interested users of the data, the AI developers, for example, have to apply, have to tell us what the scope of their research is and um, get then access uh, to, once the data providers approve, get access to the secure processing environment uh, of Incisive in order to be able to exploit the data. In the context of our data sharing framework, which is still work in progress, close to finalization, but still few challenges to resolve, we have been working on several components of this framework that, that we believe can be reusable by other projects interesting to continue sharing data even after the end of their project. We've worked on uh, a template data sharing agreement, on several technical and operational measures that ensure there is access uh, to the data in a GDPR compliant way. To address motivational and economic challenges, again, this is non-conclusive work, but uh, we have been thinking of several ways to do this. So data usage and citation requirement, we do require that any data used from Incisive, uh, the users should cite the data providers from whom they have used the data. Uh, we are giving opportunities for networking and further funding, especially through the EU Kind project that you will hear about in a while. And we are producing, uh, offering lots of technical support to reduce the workload related to sharing the data, doing a lot of training and capacity building activities, awareness raising. Uh, this is a non-ending list. Uh, we still have to do more to motivate data sharing. So to finish uh, what we've, we will achieve by the end of March 2024 and make available is an AI toolbox with AI models and AI pipelines for the four types of cancer that we are addressing, um, including federated learning mechanisms for training new AI models if necessary, 
our hybrid data repository infrastructure, which includes more than 3.7 million cancer images from more than 9,000 uh, patients, all data anonymized, of course. A data interoperability framework, uh, including our documented common data model, and a data sharing framework, methodology, and tools to support the GDPR compliant data sharing. Last, uh, we are among the lucky ones. Uh, we have a vehicle that can help us to sustain most, if not all, of the final results of our project. Uh, many of our, some of our par partners are part of the EU Kind project, and regardless of who is still in that project or not, EU Kind offers all the means that uh, we need in order to make our data uh, sustainable, again, in a GDPR compliant way, and even continue to provide our AI tools or any other final result that we would like to continue making available. We will be hearing about this uh, in the end of this session. For, for now, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, and uh, I invite all comments um, from anyone uh, at, at any time, point of time. Thank you very much. <laughs> we will now invite Dr. Oliver Diaz from the University of Barcelona. Uh, the, representing the Radioval project to talk to us about AI development and validation based on the future AI and how this is applied in the Radioval case. Thank you. Okay, uh, thanks for the invi invi invitation, first of all. And, uh, okay, is it any radiologist in the room? One, two, okay, three, a few, okay. Great. So, for those who are not radiologists, just uh, let's play this uh, game of, you know, um, be a radiologist for 10 seconds. And imagine you are a radiologist. You are working on a on a hospital. You have your your AI uh, a tool, and then your AI tool show you these sort of like a marks in the in the in the mammogram, right? This is a, a, a mammogram. And then, you know, my question would be: Would you trust uh, that uh, algorithm? You know, it's showing like many lesions, and probably uh, not all of them are real, if any is real. Uh, imagine that we manage, we process a little bit, we improve better our models, and then uh, we could reduce, we could uh, reduce these false positives that probably are appearing in the in the in the image. But still, you know, our experience as a, as a radiologist doesn't show us any any clue that there is a lesion there, although the algorithm is saying there is something there. Okay, let's go beyond that and let's include some confidence value. Let's say the, the algorithm says, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm confident 96.7% that there is something there, but still you don't see nothing in the, in the, in the image. So, so my question here would be, you know, would you trust uh, a tool, you know? Do we trust? Uh, um, medical doctors, hopefully yes. You know they they have been trained for for many years. They have experience. They have uh, you know get a lot of knowledge. But uh, you know what should be doing you know as uh, as a co co community, not just uh, AI developers, but uh, even users, patients. What can we do to really improve that trust? You know, that, that's uh, one of the questions we have been thinking about for, for, for many years. And, and in fact, it's, it's a question that many, many, many people working on the AI development is, is asking themselves and, and asking all the st stakeholders, you know, what are, what are, what are the, the, the challenges to really make uh, uh, end users uh, uh, trust the, 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 the AI tools? So there have been many efforts from the from the European Commission and, and, and actually the project officer mentioned a couple of them before. Uh, one of them was you know the this creation a couple of years ago of a high level uh, expert groups in, in in AI where they have produced many many uh, documents. One of them is this um, uh, sort of like a, a document uh, with some specifications about the, the trustworthy AI, right? How we we, we could improve the the trust of the of the different algorithms. We, it is a nice uh, reading, but uh, we have to think that this is a very general 
uh, sort of like a approach, thinking about uh, any application of, of AI for, for not, all, not only for healthcare. So it doesn't really cover all the challenges that we are facing in the healthcare dom domain. Um, also, uh, the project officer mentioned that they are, they are currently working on this uh, AI Act, right? Which is also a way to 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 really establish the different levels of of risk of the algorithm, and in the same way, trying to improve uh, the the trustworthy, like as uh, citizens, you know, what are the risk of those tools, and what uh, the 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 AI developers need to to do to make it more transparent, right? So they have been many, many efforts, but still, you know, we are facing that in the healthcare domain, we got uh, challenges that hasn't been covered yet. So uh, it has been several international uh, initiatives of uh, several researchers, inst institutions, and, and here I'm, I'm just showing some of them, right? For example, we got the, the, the claim, right, which is uh, some guidelines for researchers when they write the scientific papers, which information should be available to make it uh, that uh, uh, scientific uh, dissemination uh, reproducible, right? Or, or for the reviewers, right? When you are re reviewing one article, which information should be included, the minimum, right? To make it, uh, you know, uh, a profit for the, for the other people who is reading that, um, that um, uh, sci scientific paper. So there are many, many examples we can find in the literature uh, run by 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 uh, um, institutions, by communities, as 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 us, and I would like to stress one of them, which is the 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 future AI, which is a, an in initiative that was sort of like uh, uh, born uh, through this uh, AI for Health Imaging Network or, or cluster, right? Uh, so the future AI is sort of like some 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 international guidelines that has been you know passed through the 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 just beyond the, the AI for Health imaging, where several um, researchers uh, worldwide have been involved, experts in medical imaging in different fields, different domains, different countries, where they have been, dis where we have been discussing through online meetings, through uh, surveys, uh, how uh, the AI tools should be, uh, or should, or with information should be contained to make it uh, trustworthy. So. And we have uh, a, a scientific paper under review right now, so it's not yet available, but uh, I mean, it's not yet review, but uh, you can get uh, the sort of like a first draft uh, or first idea of these principles in, in, the, in the archive. And if, it, if you're thinking about why it's called future AI, so we are uh, defining six principles, and each of these principles is defined by, the, by the, this, this letter, right? We are, we are including fairness, universality, trust, um, uh, trustability, usability, uh, robustness, and explainability. So those are the different dimensions that we are trying to cover through the different uh, uh, guidelines, right? We minimize the number of guidelines because in, in initially we got so many, but eventually we managed to reduce them and avoid some uh, repetition, some duplication. And, um, and I would like to introduce you the Radioval project, which I would say is the, the, the baby born from the AI uh, for Health Imaging cluster, which is bo was basically some of the members of the AI for Health uh, Imaging cluster. They put together some knowledge and they, they apply for this proposal, uh, which is focused on the, on the use of radiomics, um, on, the, on the breast uh, cancer uh, radiomics, so basically extracting features from the images. And, and making this large validation uh, on not only in Europe but also beyond Europe, and trying to to apply those future AI cases I just mentioned in uh, in, uh, in in the development of a, of a, of a European project. The project is a four years uh, a four years long project, and we are almost starting on the on the on the second year. Uh, so uh, the idea, is, as I said, is to involve uh, or to include those future AI uh, principles in the AI development, in the validation stage, in the deployment, and, and make that large and in international uh, validation. Uh, so just to put you in context a little bit, to give you some, some example, the current model will give you some you know, evaluation metrics like end area under the curve, pre pre precision, accuracy, which are some numbers that might not have a, a full context of what it means. So what we are pro proposing is uh, a set of, 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 uh, of um, 
extra information to be added to make sure that you know the fairness, the bias of the data is covered. If uh, there are some bias in our data, just make sure that this is uh, sort of like announced, so the li limitation of the tool are available, and so on. So the idea is to provide uh, some uh, like context to those um, uh, principles and make sure that uh, you know eventually the final product we have whatever results is showing, it provides not only uh, a mark, like the, the first uh, uh, image I was showing, but it provides further information to really build that trust and make sure that uh, uh, the user, the patient, are all uh, like uh, they trust on the, the results of that um, model. So thank you very much. Oliver, I would now invite Dr. Costas Marias, Professor of Medical Image Analysis at HMU and Technical Director of the ProCancer Eye Project. Thank you, Jana, and uh, it's great to be in this panel with very good friends and collaborators, and I'm uh, here instead of Manol Siknakis, who is the coordinator because he was committed. Uh, so I just want to go straight away to the, to you know, what I will be trying to explain today. It's, um, I want, I just want to pass a very simple message that, you know, Pro Cancer Eye, like many other projects, uh, is I, I think it's a very successful project, but you will see that there are many challenges, um, starting from the data collection, but expanding to the AI modeling, that cannot be faced on a project alone. So I think that. I will agree with all of you that we cannot make it, a, 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 any given project cannot make it on its, on its own. And it's great that you have, we have now the opportunity for, for UK. So starting from ProCancer Pro Eye, I would uh, say that uh, it's been centered around uh, um, a number of use cases. Starting from the, I don't know if I have a pointer here. It's okay. Starting from the detection is in use case one. So we wanted to introduce AI modeling to increase detection accuracy. So do we have a tumor or not? And you know, in, 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 in uh, prostate cancer, there is uh, a big problem concerning over, uh, un, uh, you know, over diagnosis and over treatment and under diagnosis. So we created all these use, use cases to that in a way that they were aligned with the management of the patient. So after detection, we would like to know if we have, for example, metastasis, that is use case three. If uh, the patient is a high risk patient or it's uh, a medium, a low risk patient, right? If it's a low risk patient, again, we need AI models to see which of these patients are more, let's say, suitable for active surveillance pro programs, right? So this is use case eight. And uh, once a patient is, uh, is, is a high-risk patient and undergoes surgery and radiotherapy, uh, we would like to, to, to get information from AI models if, this, if, the, if the, it's going to be recurrent after prostatectomy in use case five or after radiotherapy in use case six. Of course, it's always important in the decision-making uh, in oncology to know about side effects. So if we can predict side effects, that's very valuable information for the design of the therapy, and that's in use case seven. And overall, we would like to predict the best treatment with uh, as few side effects as possible, which is use case nine. So designing the project, we were very ambitious. We wanted to do everything, right? And that, is, uh, uh, that shows that we were really committed, and, we, and we, had, we have 20 partners and many reference centers. So we started with a, a very let's say specific prospective and uh, retrospective protocol to develop and validate these nine uh, clinical scenarios. And of course, we included very strict criteria, uh, including medical images. So we needed three uh, MRI examinations, T2-weighted images, diffusion-weighted imaging, and ADC, uh, including a high B-value image. And we, we asked for, for very specific instructions and uh, our idea was to combine medical images with clinical pathology and treatment data and provide master models, uh, vendor specific models, but also vendor neutral models for a number of reasons that 
uh, we can we can discuss. Um, of course, to do that, we need to create a centralized repository, which at the time it was uh, we had the ambition to be the largest in the world, and uh, that is what we're still trying to do. It turned out that there were a lot of challenges in the way, so things were not, let's say, straightforward. For example, um, many many clinicians were uploading much more sequences than the three that we had asked. So we had to develop a number of tools and I and AI methodologies, not for answering only the clinical questions, but also for optimizing the data collection process, for, uh, let's say, inspecting quality in the data, even for identifying the three sequences that we want and uh, filtering them out from any other sequences that were uploaded. So there were many, many things that we did not, let's say, predict in the beginning of the project, and we had to develop a lot of new technologies uh, we introduced a staging area in the data uploading mechanism. We introduced a two, let's say, a layer anonymization technique. And uh, then we realized that there were wrong labels, there were wrong segmentations, so we have to develop new tools to monitor the quality of the segmentations, uh, to identify mistakes. And uh, we had to, to develop data curation tools to help the clinicians register different sequences because you know in medical image analysis that all the sequences need to be in the same geometry. And um, of course, we had a metadata repository quality check tool giving a lot of warnings. For example, let's say that we have negative patients with high PSA. So we had to give a warning, you know, to see if, it, if this was really the case or if it was a mistake. We had data that what were incomplete, that is happening a lot of times, so there was a flag, check this data because one sequence is missing, or even in the worst case, orphan data. So we had a lot of data with, without any labels, right? So this is the reality. This is what happens when you, when you, uh, you know, try to collect 10,000 uh, data from 10,000 patients or even more. So you have to develop tools and technologies to address these challenges. And in reality, uh, you know, uh, a project needs always, we need always to be prepared to create more tools, to do more work than anticipated to face these problems. And this is the list of challenges regarding data collection that came up, starting from the beginning of the project, like for example, heterogeneity in legal and ethical issues, uh, difficulty to get ethical com committee approvals. So we had problems relating, uh, let's say, semantic ontologies that in, we didn't have any uh, let's say, model to include both imaging data and clinical metadata, so we had to extend it, uh, to extend on mob CDN. And of course, all these challenges are opportunities for new work and create solutions that will be useful for the community. We had, uh, for example, other more important problems related to quality. So how do you, uh, let's say, assess quality when you don't have a standard way to do it, right? So this is an open research question, and it's a very important one. So we are we decided to go for a, a specialized PyQual, prostate image quality study. So this will, is a clinical study that we are running at this point in time in ProCancer Eye. And we're hoping with this, let's say, uh, subjective scoring of many clinicians, many experts, to be able to develop more robust tools that will be able to score the quality of the image. And of course, we have problems like any AI developers are very well aware of. For example, imbalanced data set. Right, so uh, the, the 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 data, the data splits do not resemble always the natural prevalence of, of any given disease and use case scenario. So for all of that, we are proposing solutions, and we are, for example, uh, you know, there, now we have so many options in AI modeling to choose either radiomics, deep learning, self-supervising if you have non-labeled images. So there are ways to get around problems, but. Uh, and this is the, the current situation today. You will see that we have reached the, uh, you know, our target because we, we, we were aiming for more than 10,000 pa patients. And although we had some delays, uh, we, are, we are going to get to the desired number of patients. But if we look very, very carefully, we, you will see today that uh, if we see the distribution of the, of the data with the use cases that I mentioned to you in the beginning, you will see that despite 
all our efforts to accelerate data collections, and we did that in many different ways. Whenever it was possible, we asked for uh, clinical partners that had the capacity to give more data. And so, so we find solutions for nearly all problems that came up. We, we faced a lot of quality issues, but we found the right mechanisms to monitor quality and ensure quality. We had limitations concerning the AI methodologies, but new ideas came up, like self-supervising, self let's say, algorithms that can exploit orphan data without any labels. But no matter what we did, it, was, it seems that we cannot solve everything on our own. We cannot address all the use cases because simply some of the data are not there for all the use cases, right? And we cannot do that in the lifetime of the project and with the resources that we have. So we are very grateful that we have the opportunity for UKIM. We know that other, uh, other, other institutions are like incisive, they're working on prostate cancer. So if we join forces, I'm sure we, we will be able to address all these use cases that they span along the um, prostate cancer management continuum. So thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I'm looking forward for the next uh, discussions today. Thank you very much, Costa. We will now hear from Dr. Ignacio Blanque, uh, professor in the Computer Systems Department at the Polytechnic University of Valencia about Chai Million and uh, Primage projects. Thank you so much, Diana, for the invitation. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity. So I'll try to be brief because I have the, I mean, the, the challenge to present two projects in eight minutes. So uh, the first one, I mean, I choose these two topics for each one of the projects. One was the sustainability. What do we do beyond the end of the Primage project? And the other will be the model of this virtual research environment in a central repository, which are the two things that I believe that are uh, different from the other, from my colleague's presentation. So Primage is a project that has aimed to build an open cloud-based platform for decision support system that um, focus on two pediatric cancers. One is neuroblastoma and the other is DPG. So the idea that we have there is that we have one area in which we are collecting the data and we have two different backends to support the processing of the data. One, an on-premise cloud with GPUs and uh, more process capa uh, processing capacity, which is very expensive on the cloud or could be very expensive. And the other, a supercomputer that can run um, simulation models for the growing of the cancer tumors. So this uh, project has ended. We have these data lakes uh, in place. Uh, but what we do beyond, right? So we did this analysis. So what do we have? We have over 1,000 cases of neuroblastoma and 60 cases of DIPG. So they are, uh, fortunately, they are very rare cases. We have very few. The complexity on research is therefore quite high. But at the same time, uh, clear. There's a very clear need of sharing the data to creating this data set. So this is a very valuable asset. So we have a set of tools for the segmentation and future extraction based for these um, I mean, types of data. We have a distributed processing platform and two research communities that have been organized and have learned how to work together. You know that, I mean, an old professor told me that the problem that we have here is the data mining, because everybody say data is mine, right? So in this case, the, the research community have to learn how to join forces in this direction. So for this first point, we need long-term preservation of this data, compliance to the fair principles, findability, accessibility, interoperability, and reusability to make this data reusable for the future. For the second point, we need preservation annotation for, this day, for these tools, and also the capability of being executed on a, an environment without an important effort from the, from the researcher. For the third point, we need a sustainable strategy. We cannot keep the distributed plan for forever. And for the research community, we need to provide the means for these people to keep the cooperation. So what we are thinking through the uh, transition to UK. So we need data transfer, data sharing agreements, fair compliance services that can make this data set findable, accessible under, research, uh, under restricted conditions and uh, well annotated to be reused. We need a marketplace and execution environment. We foresee a temporal federation with UK. So we have uh, the, our resources linked to the UK platform 
and thinking on a future migration of the data once we have everything in place in UK for the central repository, and we need collaboration tools, forums, joint research agreements. So that's the aim that we are uh, focusing in order to make the sustainability. So the other point, the other vision is, what do we work, how do we work in Shymillion? So Shymillion has a different focus, not these two rare um, pediatric cancers, but general cases that are more frequent. So the idea is to have a cloud-based cancer imaging repository as an online resources for the AI community. It's not just a data where warehouse is a platform for processing and that's we think that is the main innovation of this platform right so let me just go yeah that was um, the point so how do we work in shine million so we have the data centralized centralized requires some issues I mean impose some issues that we will discuss in the next slide but has the advantage that everything is well uh, defined and well we will discuss the, the benefits later so we have the data on a data lake we create collections these collections are accessible in a virtual research environment in which the researcher can insensate virtual uh, desktops with gpus attached with a batch uh, processing system underneath so they can process in situ the data without copying it back so we go through a lengthy and detailed analysis of the privacy restriction and the legal constraints we even do not allow copy paste of from inside the virtual environment to outside because i mean that was one of the conditions of the imposed by the legal regulations to ensure the maximum traceability right so we think that this is a very good approach to ensure that we have an environment in which the, the donors of the data are can trust that the information cannot go, I mean, the traceability is not lost. And we also provide the capability of uh, having a publication of the metadata on a repository for citation. So you can cite and refer to the data without the need of having an article associated to that using Zenodo. So we were discussing what was the, the advantages of this approach, because this is something inherent that we will uh, reuse partially in, in UK. So it facilitates the traceability of data access. I know perfectly who mounts with data when and why, and which tools use for processing. So it's a simplified architecture. It's high, it has higher availability. Distributed system, we've been working a lot in distributed systems, it still work, and there's a lot of complexity on the availability. The reduced cost, central resources are always easier to, to manage, have a better user experience because executing the, I mean, running a disfederated model is very good in the terms of the control of the data, but has very dif a lot of difficulties for the, for the researchers. So it simplifies also the development of new applications, have the benchmarking and validation tools. In contra uh, I mean, um, that disadvantages. So it requires, requires homogeneous data transfer agreements and data sharing agreement because we have the data in the same place. And there are some hospitals, there are some regions, there are some countries that will put some problems on that. So it may not be compatible with some specific uh, regions in, the, in Europe. We may have issues with having pseudonymized, anonymized data mixes, so we have to be very careful with that. We have to, uh, I mean, uh, to share the resources. We have to find very good schemas for balancing resources, balancing the use of the, of the services, and that's something that is uh, critical and a need to homogenize data much more than in a federated environment. So just to conclude, uh, sorry, yeah. Pretty much in million will end up with a set of joint assets that will need to be preserved for sure. The federated model is the fastest approach for the smooth transition because we have the, the resources in place and we are linking. Progressive adaptation of data using mediators uh, to have a full compliance is uh, an approach. And the viable option is a viable option until the central storage is fully uh, procured. However, it has several problems. Federated model is cumbersome in terms of exploitations, and central storages with isolated partitions may also be a solution. And that's all from my side. Eight minutes. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, Ignacio. Our last, uh, but definitely not least, uh, probably most uh, interesting speaker is Dr. Uh, Luis Marti Bonmati, the director of the medical imaging department at the La Fe Polytechnic University Hospital, who will uh, present to us how all of these efforts that we heard about in this session can be made interoperable and uh, hopefully united and sustainable through the eu kind project. Um, well, thanks a lot, uh, Diana, for, for the introduction and also for all your help during all these years within AI for health imaging and within EUKIME. And I, um, I will try to share with you, um, let's say, the EUKIME um, way of allowing researchers to perform research. Uh, EUKIME is not a research project is the construction of an infrastructure aiming to help all of you plus all the ones who will come with new ideas or thoughts to construct an um, environment just to solve research problems. I mean, having a hypothesis and then objectives, then looking for data, tools, places to allocate data, ways to link researchers, and so on. And we understood that the best way, when I do say we, is mainly people from AI for Health Imaging who are behind uh, EUKIM, we understood together with the European Commission that there should be a long-term infrastructure, not just a research project for four years, but a long-term um, architecture that will help researchers to do that. And if we concentrate on the left part of the, of the graph, of the pictogram, we do see that uh, we want to link already existing repositories that will maybe disappear after the end of their projects to uh, allow either data sharing or data transfer I mean, we don't care at the end where the data is located. If it's going to disappear, take it within Ukraine. If you are using your own repositories, keep the data there, but allow researchers to, to know which type of data you, do you have, and maybe to also work with your data for another project, which is the reusability part of uh, FAIR. And um, we will link, or we are linking or all those AA for Health Imaging projects, but we are also linking and trying to engage all the other projects that are already existing at the European level within the Horizon Europe or the IHI or um, IMI uh, initiatives. And, and also we are willing to link uh, already existing infrastructures which are the ERICs, the European Research Infrastructures, like EATRIS or Eurobioimaging, um, also to provide and to allow researchers to access to the data they do have there in a federated approach. But there are many other places where data is located, like uh, pharmaceutical companies, they are performing clinical trials and there is a huge amount of images and data under their um, storage uh, places. And we are um, telling them, no, please come within uh, EUKIM because we want to, to allow researchers to have access to that data. And also there are regional biobanks or national biobanks already existing uh, large repositories that we want to allow them um, also to be part no, of this infrastructure. And by doing that, together with the central storage that we will provide, we do have a fast access to images, to a huge amount of images, which is big data on images, just to allow um, experimental research to be performed with AI tools on that scenario. But that's not enough. I mean, data is continuously being produced at the hospitals. So we need to link hospitals. Also because the questions we do have today 
will not be the same questions on research we will have tomorrow. And we have to allow researchers to have access to new data, to solve new problems. And the only way to do that is to link the uh, different large amount of hospitals at the European level on a federated way. And the good thing to do that is that we can perform then observational studies on real world data on an extremely fast way if we already have agreed and discussed the architecture of the data warehouse. That's the place where data from uh, the clinical electronic health records are copy every day, uh, pseudonymized to be able to be used in clinical studies and uh, research projects. So that environment of the data warehouses we will see later is already important for us. But we also understood that there is a huge amount of data also coming from screening programs and a screening for cancer uh, where images are relevant, are mainly breast, but also lung with CT, low dose CT, and prostate uh, with EMA, which is now into the screening program of uh, patients with uh, high uh, PSA. So we are linking also those programs and projects that screen patients, also willing not to pick up tumor, not to use AI tools to facilitate the role of detection, but also willing to detect changes on those organs before the tumor appear, because we will have all the temporal series on the screening programs. People go on surveillance, so every two years or three years or four years or five, we will have images and we can use AI tools to rise before the tumor appear the uh, suspicious of the area where the tumor or the lesion will develop. And, and also we want to push data altruism. I mean, we are all citizens and we should not only think that maybe data should be there, we are working on how, which is the legal and ethical aspects that will allow all of us just to fill a paper so our data will be used not only within EUCAIN, but uh, within any other, let's say, project. And uh, to do that, we do have the first prototype, thanks to Nacho Blanquer. Um, on that prototype, we do have a catalog linking all the data from all those projects coming from the AI for health imaging. We also do have possibilities. No? We are working now to there on how to do the federated search on, on, on cases. I mean, looking for a specific whatever. I mean, I do need MR or CT on these patients with this cancer. And we also started with the negotiator, how to allow researchers to search for that data. And of course, a uh, help this. And we define the access uh, request process, meaning that we do need an uh, access committee for researchers looking for images, but also request for collaboration. I mean, Eukaim is willing to be partner on the projects and proposals and uh, programs that will appear no? and, and that are being constructed today because that's the way we understand sustainability will be feasible. Not only just providing data or access to data, also providing resources, tools, and research communities, no? and people who were already engaged on research and know how to do that properly. So this is the uh, way no? we understand we should really go into sustainability. But on, not only that, I mean, Eukaim, after these four years, we are constructing the infrastructure, is willing to be a EDIC. EDIC means an European Digital Infrastructure Consortium. Now we have seven countries with expression of interest. We already have a working group at the European level, which is coordinated by Spain, 
defining the status and engaging other countries to allow this uh, infrastructure to be here for the rest of our lives, no? at least. So that was my summary on the sustainability of EUCAIM. We do have documents for that. We are engaging really countries, companies, institutions, academies, I mean, whoever is willing to be part of this initiative. Thank you. Luis, thank you very much uh, for the very comprehensive overview of so much, such a big, huge project as EU Kaim is in such nicely condensed slides.